Hi everyone, this is Olga Mack and welcome to Notes to My Legal Self. It's good to see you. Notes to My Legal Self is the place where we talk about anything and everything that in-house legal professionals care about. And it turns out legal professionals are just like normal humans and they are humans <laughs> first. They care about things like substantive law. They also care about career. They care about their community. They have hobbies. So if you know somebody from whom we can learn together, who can show us how much of a human they are, uh, let me know. I would like to have that person on the show and we can learn collectively together and you can ask questions. So DM me, put in the notes, tag those folks. I will get in touch with them. I am on the mission to find in-house legal talent worldwide for us to learn together. Again, welcome to the show. And I'm going to ask Alex, our fantastic guest, to introduce himself. Alex, tell us more about yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Olga. Uh, thanks for having me. I am Alex Rosales. I have spent about the past 10 years primarily focused on data privacy work, cybersecurity, product work. Uh, I would consider myself like a, a hybrid uh, in-house counsel, uh, taking on long-term engagements at some of your favorite big tech clients, uh, most recently at Twitter and currently at PayPal. Uh, I spent uh, some time in big firm law and so I know what I know what that's about and have just kind of decided to take this career path and have seen a lot of really cool, interesting uh, developments in data privacy recently. So uh, happy to be on the show. <laughs> Our favorite tech companies. Yeah, I live in the Valley. There's quite a lot of them. I, um, I, I have a hard time picking the favorite, but you named some good ones. <laughs> yeah, there's some good ones in there. <laughs> in, no particular order, in no particular order for my clients. Yeah, yeah. No, it's like, you know, like I can't tell my children which one I love better. Exactly, I, right? I love you no. all the same. You're all equally <laughs> stubborn. <laughs> well, I tell them, look, I have a hand. If I had to pick a finger, that would be a bad day because they're all important to me. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly, exactly right. I like that. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, I like that you mentioned the hybrid role. I increasingly see this among uh, in-house legal professionals. Tell us, what does it mean in your case and how did you get here? You know, I think for me, I... Uh, so after law school, I went to Harvard Law in 2003, spent some time in a big, a big law, Melvin A. Myers in downtown LA, and uh, decided to go to business school. You know, I think a lot of lawyers think about that. Um, uh, once I was in business school, I kind of realized that I was better at doing the things that I was doing than everyone else at the business school. I mean, I think, I think it was interesting, but it was kind of like, hey, I'm going to go back to work, guys. That, that, that was fun. <laughs> um, so in some ways, I, lear I learned a lot, though. I, I felt like one of the biggest takeaways was consulting, right? A lot, a lot of folks, a lot of my peers went into consulting right after into McKinsey and some of these big consulting firms. And at the time, I, I think it was Axiom Law that was starting sort of a similar practice. And I thought that would be a really good way to sort of learn best practices, especially in a place like data privacy, right? I mean, this was before the GDPR was really kind of being enforced. And, and I think in some ways, you sort of had to carve your own path. And this was a really good way to do that. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. We, I, we increasingly say, seeing this sort of gig economy, consulting, flexibility, influence everyone, and yes, lawyers. Um, and uh, I, 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 ha I haven't been one, but I've, I've had folks like yourself report to me, and they have been invaluable members of my legal team. They've added expertise and energy and insights, and sometimes from different geographies. They were super valuable. Um, and I've considered them, you know, like you usually talk about law firm as an extended part of your team. I thought of them as my team. Um, yep, and, I, you, know, they, you know, so it was, it was, it was not just an extended part. It was, you know, they were the heart and soul. So it's really interesting, um, that, that, that you, you, you got there. Tell me how you got to privacy, right? Uh, I mean, I, you know, I consider myself a privacy professional too. Uh, full disclosure: I went to law school because of security, <laughs> privacy. I, I live in the valley, and I saw the, this, you know, this area to be important. And uh, but curious, kind of, what influenced your decision to focus on privacy? How did you get there? Um, I mean, in some ways, it was just dumb luck. Uh, my first engagement out of Axiom was a F FTC consent decree. 
uh, for Fandango, you know, which was very privacy driven. So some ways I think I just kind of stumbled into it uh, and, and I liked it though. But I, but I also felt like um, there was a future in it because it, it's, it's a currency in a way that, and I think everyone knows this now, right? Understanding people's behavior, how, uh, how folks interact online, you know, this takes the form of marketing, right? And marketing is not new and, and, and the ways in which people understand information have everything to do in which, in the ways in which we engage that information online now, right? And so I think it was just seemed like a natural sort of progression to, to commerce, right? Um, but, yeah. I, but I felt like companies were going to have to deal with it eventually, I guess, in some ways, right? Well, it, was also, it, was also, it was also like between <laughs> me and the rest of the lawyers, right? It's, it's something that over time you've been warning about over the years and then now you see many fines. Yeah, well, FTC and SEC are forcing the issue. I mean, you know that when SEC gets into something, that that's important, but FTC have been sending a pretty clear message now for a while. Um, you said something interesting, um, and I kind of want to spend a little bit more time on that. You, you said that privacy is really a currency, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting statement. Um, Tell us what you before before going into what should be the case. Why 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 you feel that privacy essentially is a currency today online? Um, I, I, you know, this is just sort of uh, you know my my theory, right? In, in some ways, right? It's, it's not a law, right? It's just to be clear. But but I think in some ways, in the same way, cryptocurrency goes uh, across boundaries, data until you regulate it and hold uh, folks accountable for it is the thing that has been going across jurisdictions and boundaries for a long time, right? And, and so in some ways, just information by itself uh, becomes a currency in, in, in the case that you're tying transactions to information, right? You're able to predict and create future projections even as a business around re really data, right? So if you remove kind of the boundaries around it, well, I mean, it starts to sort of look like that uh, in a sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. I mean, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, right? I mean, the web too was built on the exchange of, you know, I, I access your social media if you can own the data that I produce in, uh, during my uh, adventures there. Um, and, you know, we've seen the rise of CCPA and GDPR in response to that premise of essentially using data, your personal data, um, um, as a currency, as an ex medium of exchange, right? That's what currency is, really. That's what money is. You know, be, you know and yeah, there is also rise of Web3, which raises a different a, a conversation of can we actually, who, who has a right to that value? But I think fundamentally, I agree with you. This, this has been somewhat an organic movement in technology, and we definitely see that. Um, that brings me to an important conversation of how do, you, how do companies today you know, use that data um, in their daily activities? I think companies use data differently depending on the company. And that is one of the things that differentiates companies, right? And the use of data, uh, mm -hmm. how data feeds into models, how then data is exchanged and the ecosystem that that company has as an exchange of data with its partners, its customers, its parent companies, subsidiaries around the world, that in a way defines the company more and more these days. Okay, so if you were to say categorize, right? Um, let's talk a little bit about if you had to put that one right in the buckets, right? If you had to categorize kind of the kind of companies we see today, categorically speaking, with the way they handle data, and you know, that kind of where we are in snapshot. And then like, what is your prediction for the future? What, do, do we think that there will be sort of convergence? Is there a trend where we see the companies going? To get a little bit more specific, right? I think if you had to just create a couple buckets, right? You have companies that use data as a means of selling a product possibly, right? Or a defined like a peripheral company, right? That maybe uses data as part of their value proposition now, you know, and, and I'm thinking about a non-client, right? Like, a, like Sonos, right? Right. You've got a product, you, you've got, you've got a data associated with a product. And then you've got companies that essentially are primarily driven by the harnessing of data and uh, either tying services around it through platforms, software, right? Or you've got just data itself and the way that that company then 
uses that data and then uh, distributes it in the ecosystem, defines that, right? So I think in some ways, you can create a physical boundary between the two, but I think over time, you're going to see that just start to blend, right? To answer that second part of your question. What, what becomes the physical space, what becomes data, what becomes a service is going to start to sort of blend together. Let me process that. That blending I'm not ready for yet. <laughs> <laughs> you asked me. You <laughs> no, no, I, I, I know. So maybe if we were to explain what does it like put a little bit more certainty on that blending, um, how would the experience of a consumer change with that blending? And then I guess related, you know, what is going to be a company's reaction or what is going to be their choices, I guess. Sure. And, you know, again, this is all kind of speculative, right, in some ways. But I, I think, for example, um, one of the big issues now is uh, cookies. My, my life is cookies, right? It's been cookies for a long time. And it's not the good cookies. Hey, cookies are not the <laughs> worst place to be, They're okay? Delicious. <laughs> cookies are delicious. Um, <laughs> and the crumbs are everywhere when it comes they're everywhere. to data. <laughs> they're everywhere. They're everywhere, right? And so they're delicious to myself. They're delicious to marketers, right? They're delicious to companies. And everybody's been feasting on cookies for a long time, right? Pun totally intentional there. Uh, so what I think is going to happen is how you define essential cookies and what is considered non-essential, right? Just to draw sort of a broad category between the two. Essential is what you need to drive your product or service and non-essential being like what maybe you're agreeing to as part of a setting. And I, you know, I don't worry too many of the details on that, but, but the point is those two categories are going to maybe shift around a little bit depending on what the product is, right? Because if you, you probably don't need biometric data, right? You probably don't need to scan my, my, my fingerprints, right? Or, or, or my face to do a lot of the stuff that you do now, right? But if you're living in a world where you have, let's say, uh, glasses that give you a three-dimensional space or you're creating an avatar that's now swimming around in, in the metaverse, uh, well, then, you know, maybe some of that information becomes more relevant, right? So then, you know, establishing clear guidelines as to what that data does exactly for what you're doing, I think starts to make um, more sense, but I think also consumers are going to become more aware of it, right? So, so in that way, I think you're going to start to see a blend. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. I like I, I like what Web three is bringing to this space because it really more squarely kind of focuses on where you started, which is privacy is valuable, and therefore it effectively anything that is of value is effectively a currency. So all this privacy, all this reputation are valuable, and therefore could be exchanged for other things. We have been exchanging it but without thinking. Now we're going to think about it. Very interesting conversations. You mentioned, you know, say bio data, you know, biometrics data um, is becoming more prevalent in software, for example. Um, and we should start thinking about kind of what's necessary, what's nice to have, what are the parameters of collections, what responsibilities and all that. I'm curious, kind of you personally, again, you know, I know you repeated a few times that it's a speculative conversation. <laughs> uh, Alex, the best yeah. conversation is a speculative. So we're going to have agree. the best conversation here. <laughs> um, who do you think should do that? I mean, do you think that's like a government job or do you think it's an industry's <laughs> job? Like should, you know, like should like a like, uh, GDPR model where the EU tells us what to do. The FTC model where they regulate, uh, legislate by regulating, essentially, um, you know, uh, or more like, you know, CCPA model where it's state by state, you know, what is like, but it, what, I know the world will end up where the world will end up, but you as an in-house professional, where would you like the world to end up? Um, I think a North Star vision, which provides clarity to all parties is, the best approach, right? So whether that's a GDPR, whether it's another piece of legislation, I don't know, right? So what I would say is you need clarity and you need that vision to go across boundaries because that's going to sort of diminish friction generally and it's going to decrease confusion, but you can't get there in a vacuum, right? So then you need, you sort of need all the stuff in between to figure that out. Right. I hate to give you that. It, it depends. No, 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 it's not even depends. It's a kind of more general business principle. All our sequel business is going to operate better if it has clarity. You know, it's better to have a clear bad news than to have uncertainty. 
um, in the world of business because for the bad news we can kind of prepare for it and 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 uh, build around it so to speak or build with it when you are uncertain you don't know what to do so you're in paralysis uh, yeah no i mean that, that is not that is not a depends answer that is just a real business reality you know and i'm just curious kind of who you think should be um you know how you know who should be involved and is it a government job or consumers group's job or industry job really uh i think in some ways the three should work together right like in an ideal world government should have uh perfect information with a business that is only driven to provide like what it discloses and consumers should be 100% informed so that all three worked in perfection, right? But that this is not reality, right? So then I think it depends on which jurisdiction you're talking about, right? Like in certain jurisdictions, I don't know if the government should be involved right? as heavily with the with the processing of everyone's personal data. I don't know which government you're talking about. I'm not talking about any particular governments, but I'm saying, <laughs> right? Like it depends in that way, right? I mean, if you have full transparency across all three, then, then in theory, you know, it's one informs the other, which then legislates, and then you have like a little bit of litigation to figure it out and a few consequences. What you're seeing nowadays is massive fines um, on certain companies operating in the EU, right? And you're you're seeing uh, certain governments be more active in certain areas, right? So you're sort of getting there, um, but 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 I think it's not uh, spread evenly at all. Yeah, yeah, no, no that's that's about right. So I'm going to ask you kind of a more career oriented question then. Look, I mean, you and I both decided to be privacy professionals pretty early. For me, it was actually before I went to law school. Um, and I sort of pride myself being in it early, you know, 20 years ago, I decided and when I was in law school, the cases where we were looking at and, you know, there's no FTC decisions really. Um, it was, uh, or really much other and CCPA was not around and GDPR was not around. Uh, all there was is search and seizure cases. <laughs> so True. like completely different world. So I pride myself on being in the beginning. I increasingly have conversations in the industry and pe people tell me that privacy is a new and exciting place, you know, that we're in the beginning of it. Um, you know, and I sort of had this conversation with my husband. I was like, I was 20 years ago and I felt like it was a beginning. Now, 20 years later, people tell me it's the beginning. That's interesting. And he said, Olga, privacy and data are going to be relevant for at least next 1,000 years. All of you are in the beginning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're going to be there in the beginning at the end of your life. The beginning is long. And I thought that was a really interesting observation. The beginning is long. I agree with that. And we are all still in the beginning. We'll be there for a long time. Yet I think the, the, the kind of things you did in the very, very beginning, like in the year two versus in the year 20 versus in the year 50 is different. Uh, because, you know, the, the, the industry is evolving. So my question to you, if I am an in-house professional today and I want to get on top of it, whether I actually, you know, specialize in it or work with others who do, what would you recommend folks in the beginning today <laughs> to, to do to be ready with the realities of, you know, this juncture of Web 2, Web 3? That's a really good question. So, uh, with the understanding that I'm like a total hypocrite because I kind of just accidentally fell into privacy and realized I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, I almost think it's important to understand where you want to end up to define the beginning, right? So if you are interested in privacy as a part of sort of your general trajectory, but you know, you want to be more of a generalist, that's a different approach, right? Um, if you want to be, I think, really specialized in privacy, um, I find that Technical skills go a long way. Um, I think that taking some of the tests around privacy that, that are offered by IAPP and some of the exchanges out there are, are actually very important to establish a base. But I think the more you understand, and you have to excuse the phrase, but if you know, the more you know where the bodies are buried, right, in, in these tech companies, the more you're going to be valuable, right? I mean, that that's just how it is, right? As as an attorney, you you need to sort of add a certain amount of valuable information to the conversation that has real practical application to the day-to-day -day lives of engineers and folks who are making decisions on the fly. So the more you understand the product, the more you understand how things really work, I think the easier it will be to find your way into privacy. Yeah, no, I'm with you. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's you know, number one question people ask me about Web3, do they need to learn how to, to, to code? 
And my answer to them is actually kind of what you just said in privacy is that privacy is a very technical field. Security and privacy are very technical field. You have to understand the data flow. If you have not, you know, indulged yourself in the exercise of understanding the data flow map of your product, you're probably just going to be reciting what's available on the internet. <laughs> That's yeah. kind of the bottom line. <laughs> and you yep. will be adding no value and a very good business professional will, will point that out to you. Sometimes nicely, sometimes not. So it is a conversation where your reality has to be rooted in technology and product and all of that. And so, you know, you don't have to code, but it's very helpful that you understand the juicy details and frankly, your advice is going to be much more valuable. Um, I want to shift gears just a little because, and you alluded to that, um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about it. There's sort of you know, data and privacy because of the traumatic experiences. Oh, I don't know, World War II and many others. There's a sort of moral application about like how much you know about me, can you track me, like all of that stuff that is, you know, can have implications, sometimes life threatening. So this thing is real <laughs> and we've had parts of history that we're not flattering. So there, you know, what where is the discourse on this sort of morality? and you know philosophical discussion in privacy security today well you really know how to ask the questions olga <laughs> <laughs> uh i'm just so I, I think it's the world so the climate impacts the considerations right like privacy is premised upon an exchange of information between the end user and the company and whatever is the company providing right product service it doesn't matter right at the end of the day You've got an information exchange between the two. And if you assume that the information is transparent and people are, and everyone understands what they're getting, then in a way, right, that climate is, the risk in that climate is mitigated for. I think the problem is when you don't have a really good idea what information is being provided between the two, meaning the end user is driven through, you know, 50 different flows of data and they're agreeing to things they have no idea what they're actually agreeing to right like you and i've read these agreements like it's very difficult to understand even what they mean to a professional so the more that that becomes uh, diluted the more risk you have of misinformation uh creating risk that can be taken advantage of by not just governments but also just the dark web right i mean uh data breaches are real people really do steal information that information really is sold on the dark web like these are actual things that not they're not just in the movies like this happens on a massive scale right so those kind of societal fractures just begin to exponentially grow the less control there, there is around them yeah yeah no this, this stuff is real uh, and it's, it's it has implications and moral philosophical economic all of it you know personal um just talk to somebody who lost their identity and what a nightmare it's been to restore it um you will never get on the internet in the same way again if you have that conversation with someone um i have a few more questions so i'm gonna just kind of in no particular order um ask you they're somewhat related to things we talked about but they're also maybe a little bit new Let's talk about breaches you know we have seen quite a few of them it feels like there's an increasing number of them they are increasingly more sophisticated too. But that aside, let's talk about, about numbers. It seems like there's more. Am I am I like wrong? Is it just me uh, having I, no, bias? There's, there's or? more. Uh, there, <laughs> there's more. I mean, I think I don't have the data right in front of me, but but there are definitely more. But also, you have in a greater awareness of them. And I think um, as so, for example, right? You know, if you think about it, as you negotiate more and more DPAs, right? Yeah, data processing agenda. Sorry. And not everybody's a privacy professional, right? So data processing addendum, you've got all these agreements that are particular and have obligations to report breaches. You've also got more disclosures out there, right? And you've got more laws around them. So there are more, there's more awareness, and there are also more just built-in mechanisms through government as well as commercial means that are pushing these out, right? And now there's lawsuits around them, right? So it's an ecosystem that's coming out of things that are now happening more, but then that whole ecosystem around it is maturing as it's happening, right? So your previous question, what's the moral obligation? I think the moral obligation in some ways is for the governments to protect their people from harm, right? Like fundamentally, that's kind of what we all buy into. Um, and that has no political implication one way or the other. I think we can all agree to that. And so this ecosystem, I think, is a byproduct of also the real harm that people have suffered 
And as a result, you're just going to see more and more, right? It's just going to be a bit of a race between the two. Yeah, it does seem like we're converging toward the sort of European view of, of privacy being a human right uh, increasingly. I don't think we started there, but we definitely seem to be converging there. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. And it's an interesting field. Remember, we're still in the beginning. Um, right. So if you're eager to get in, not too late. It won't be late for the next 50 years. Now is the time. If you're interested, later is the time too. Um, if you just want to kind of bring popcorn and watch, also a great movie. Uh, so do that too. <laughs> um, let's talk about the the war in Europe now. Um, you know, I was just recently talking to one of the leading investigative journalists, and I pointed out that yeah, there is sort of heavy machinery involved in on the uh, in in Ukraine. You know, there's clearly and, and people getting killed, so clearly the war is real and physical and all that in the traditional sense of the word. But then there is, you know, there are other sort of related wars. Um, you know, there's the sort of war of media, right? And then there is sort of war with data and sort of various breaches. Um, so what is the U.S. position on this sort of cybersecurity and kind of what, what have we seen s- since the war? Is there an impact of the war on cyber um, security and privacy? I think um, I think when, when you think about war, right, and whether it's, you know, real or not, whatever it is, right, I think we can assume that it is. And if we can assume that it is, then war is an attempt to win at, you know, whatever means are available and, being able to attack the infrastructure of the other through means that are electronic, right? Being able to impact elections possibly, right? Or at least cause um, doubt about them, right? All of those things are, are, are things that are part of war in a way that war is not available, right? So why was this not part of previous wars? Well, there wasn't the internet before, right? So, so there's no war around cybersecurity when there's no internet, right? A hundred years ago, but now that there's, there's the internet, this is another... Right, it's in the way that when you think about battleground. <laughs> that's it. It's just sea, land, sea, air, cyber. Right. It's just you know the fourth dimension. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very interesting. And and, and do you think we, as a nation, let me even just speak broad. But as a democratic world that includes others, ready for this? No, I don't. I actually don't. Right. If I can be fully honest, I don't because I think that. Um, we are at such early stages of understanding how data is being actually used that I think we really have no way of predicting what would be the outcome, right? And, and it could be a very positive outcome. It could be a negative outcome, right? I have no way of knowing, right? But I think in the same ways that probably when Facebook was started, right, as, as a way, you know, as an actual book of faces, right? No one could have predicted what was going to be the outcome. I think we're at the beginning stages of no one is really truly able to understand what the ability for companies to create and governments to create sort of multi-dimensional right behavior filled like uh, avatars of people and then predict their behavior what that's going to do right like for example we, we just don't know yeah yeah um we are in the beginning <laughs> still very <laughs> much uh that because uh there's a lot of things that are so it's not an equilibrium, basically. I think that to me, that's the definition of the beginning. It's such a still rapidly evolving field. There is no equilibrium on so many points. That is squarely the beginning. Um, and it feels like it is a beginning. It doesn't feel any less the beginning than 20 years ago, really. Um, my last question is, given how beginning of a beginning it is, and that, you know, we're not just, yes, you know, the, the human right is important, but then there's like real implications in lives. And, and world and, and hack things I care about, like democracy. So what can in-house lawyers do uh, to, to you know, be better advisors, to, to help the companies? Yes, stay away from clients, but actually do the right things. Uh, and, you know, maybe even make sure that, you know, democracy wins in the end. Um, you know, I, I think in this way, in-house counsel can have a very positive impact on, on I think, transparency in general. I think these are difficult conversations to have with clients sometimes, right? Because the, the answer is, well, guys, things have changed, <laughs> right? So <laughs> no one wants to hear that, right? No, no client wants to hear, 
we're still in the beginning. <laughs> no one wants to hear that. So, uh, so I think you have to be transparent and, and you also have to have the tough conversations. You have to have detailed conversations and, and really kind of really be a champion for the right thing because the right thing is going to be the right thing for your business. Businesses that get this right are going to have transparent products as the human population begins to understand how valuable their data is. They're going to expect that they're going to demand it. This is not going to be government driven only in my opinion. I think most people are going to want to know where their information is. Right. Yeah. You mentioned a couple of resources. You mentioned IPP, you mentioned like really understanding your product and services, kind of where data lives and map it out and have a business partner who kind of explain things to you. Do you have any other suggestions or kind of recommendations for folks in house who may be leading privacy or, you know, one way or another touch or supervise it? Uh, any other resources or books that you love? I, I'll throw one that I like. I like Dan Sol of Sol's um, um, blog and events. I think he's a thought leader in the space and I really like what he does, including because he does it with pictures and I tend to be a visual person. Um, but you know, in, in your case, do you have any favorite people you follow or resources you use? You know, and yes, FTC has a lot of resources. Um, you should go read some recent decisions. You will know quite a lot about uh, where we're going, uh, legally speaking. So I'm going to give um, very pragmatic advice about this. That's not that exciting, but it's the truth. I would go and read the privacy statements of some of the top tech companies out there and really read them right because day one on the job it's only there are only so many companies out there that are transacting and you know you're gonna have to do it anyway <laughs> right and so i i actually highly recommend going through and and being very detailed and reading reading the privacy statements everything's everything's out there that's the nice thing about privacy it's all it's all out there the statements, but not the backend practices, but the statements give you a preview of backend practices, right? That, that's what you know. I agree. That's, and I usually joke that, you know, when you read, when you read somebody's privacy statement is, and you can kind of tell their posturing on, on this issue is, is it 20 years old? Because you can tell, is it, was it copy and paste from Google privacy? Because <laughs> 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 that's the thing, right? Or a few yep. other giants. But then, I mean, the reality, I mean, that's that true. This, this company is one, you know, because their business models are around data and it's important to them. They're likely to be scrutinized and, and, and if they get it wrong, penalized. Um, but more importantly, they're industry leaders and everybody kind of watches them. And, and in some ways, they are sort of setting up industry practices. And if you completely right out, if you look, for example, you know, what Google and Apple is doing, it's increasingly fewer words, less legalese, more white space, more pictures. It's much easier to navigate. You can zero into your rights much. So that's that's definitely a trend in the industry. There are many other trends in terms of actual substantive practices. Um, Alex, this has been a fantastic conversation. I, I, I learned so much from you and I really enjoyed kind of the framing of, of privacy as a valuable thing that is behaves very much like a currency and hence why we see this you know development continued development in the field but i have to say goodbye we've come to the end uh, i've learned so much from you <laughs> what is the one thing you want you know folks who view this conversation what is the one takeaway uh, you want them to have it was a real pleasure olga uh I, honestly I, I really love talking about this stuff i think you can tell i really enjoy it i think uh, the one takeaway i would say is you know fundamentally it, it's uh do, do the right thing and be an advocate for transparency. It will create business value, if not this quarter or the next. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. I, I you know from one passionate professional on privacy to another, this has been great. Um, and I love how we're all in the beginning of it. Uh, that means that even more passionate professionals like you and I will enter and will have a meaningful impact. Um, everyone, thank you for joining. This has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, for me, I, 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 it's actually a really interesting framework to think of privacy as something is super valuable that behaves akin to currency. And, and because it is so valuable, you know, it can be misused, it can be abused. And, and you know, I think it's really interesting for us to think about what is our role as in-house leaders, um, you know, in guiding companies around it even if we don't touch privacy, even if, you know, directly 
um, we always deal with it indirectly. I think increasingly we do, you know, I think as Alex said, have pressures of also asking what is the right thing to do. Uh, the the regulations and the laws are have been evolving, have, will be continuing evolving, and will be influenced by good and traumatic recent events. So we actually don't know where we're going to end up. But the good news for us who are engaged and who want to practice law one way or another, it's an opportunity for us to be in the beginning, right? To enter the field and make a meaningful district. So those things that I invite you to think about and take away from this conversation. Um, as I mentioned before, if you know another in-house leader who can add to a substantive personal career or community conversation for in-house professionals, because we know that in-house professional cares about all of those things because we're human first. Let me know. I look forward to recommendations and inviting this person have a chat with me so we can all learn collectively. Thank you so much. I am really grateful that you've been able to join us and I look forward to seeing you again.